Splatoon's diversity and creativity in its weapon design has always stood out to me as one of my favorite aspects of the series, and subweapons are no exception to this. Over the years, new and unique subweapons have been added, and old ones have been heavily reworked and reimagined in ways that changed how players use them. Aside from your classic bombs, though, two utility subweapons have stayed largely the same ever since the beginning, at least in the way that they're used. And in this episode, we'll be talking about one of these, a sub that does just one thing, but does it very well. Hello, I'm Pika, a high-level Splatoon coach and competitive player, and welcome back to our Utility Guide series. It has once again been a while since last time, so if this is your first time catching this series, then the main thing to know is that it's exactly what it sounds like. Many of Splatoon's weapon kits come with utility-based subweapons, or essentially anything that is not a traditional bomb. I believe weapons with these subs are often overlooked by players as they tend to be a bit tougher to understand and find value from, and that's what these guides are here to help with. The playlist with every episode so far will be linked below, which you can check out after this. Now that we're caught up, our subject for today is the Master of Reconnaissance, Point Sensor. There is much to discuss on what this means and the ways they can help you in your matches, but let's begin by reviewing how point sensors function exactly. Using and throwing out a point sensor will cost you 45% of your ink tank by default, tying it with Burst Bomb for the second lowest ink consuming sub in the game, and second only to Ingle Shooter. When used, sensors travel in an arc much in the same way as most bombs and other throwable subs, with the only thing of note here being that sensors have the fastest default velocity and therefore the farthest default throwing distance of any sub with this type of motion, being ever so slightly faster than even fizzy bombs and torpedoes. Sensors will travel until they collide with any solid surface at which point they will spawn a large spherical area that persists for two and a half seconds. Any enemies within or that enter into that area while it is lingering will be marked, showing their position to you and all of your teammates. By default, this sensor effect lasts for eight seconds, but this duration can be heavily altered by abilities. Sub Power Up has two effects on point sensors. The first is that it increases the marking duration of your sensors from that default 8 seconds, with the maximum amount being 16 seconds with a full build of sub power. However, this marking duration can also be decreased by your opponents if they wear sub resistance up, and by a pretty significant amount too. Even an opponent with only one sub slot of sub resistance equipped on their gear will have their tracking duration reduced by nearly 20%. So while the tracking time of sensors can get pretty insane in theory, especially with sub power added on, the opponent's abilities can also do a lot to keep that in check. Increasing the tracking time is the first buff sub power gives to sensors, but it has a second effect as well. Like with every other sub thrown in the same fashion, sub power also gives a boost to the throwing velocity of these subs, which in effect increases the distance that they travel. Both of these effects are pretty nice to have, and the increased sensor time from sub power can help to counteract sub resistance that the opponent might have equipped. So I personally like using sub power on these things. That said, they really don't need a whole lot or any if it's not to your tastes. I typically will devote just two sub gear slots to sub power, or six ability points, just to get a bit more flexibility out of my sensors. There's a few more quick mechanics to cover before moving on. First, in addition to the visual indicators involved with being tagged by a point sensor, the game also helps to indicate the effect to players with audio cues. Both when marking an opponent with a point sensor, or when being marked by one yourself, an audio cue will be played that lets you know the effect has been applied. If the person being tagged by a point sensor already has the effect applied to them, the same audio will still play, informing you that your timer for being marked has been refreshed. Take a listen. Lastly, let's give a bit more insight into how the sensor area, or cloud as we could call it, works. Like we said, the sensor effect gets applied in a spherical area centered where the point sensor makes contact with the part of the stage terrain. What's important to understand about this is that like Toxic Mist, the cloud ignores walls and solid ground and passes right through them. This means that hitting a point sensor against a thin wall can let the resulting cloud reach through and detect anyone that might be on the other side. More importantly in general, this means you don't have to be that precise when tossing sensors around, as small boxes or ledges or other parts of the stage near the area that the sensor lands won't block or interrupt them. If an opponent is next to where a point sensor lands, even if that spot is behind a wall or something else, they'll still get tagged so long as they're within that radius. That covers all of the direct mechanics behind point sensors. Notice how there was no mention of any damage being dealt or paint being placed down by sensors. The only thing that sensors provide is that marking effect, hence my intro comment on how sensors are all about doing one particular thing. Therefore, to fully understand how to use point sensors and get the most out of them, what we really need to explore is the utility that comes from working around this marking effect. 
In essence, what point sensors are truly all about is information. When an opponent is revealed and tracked by a point sensor, that effect's impact on the game comes from providing you and your teammates with the knowledge of where that opponent currently is. While this effect does not directly threaten your opponents, what it does do is give your team direction on where to focus your attention and resources, and make the most out of everything else that you have. Splatoon is a chaotic and fast-paced game, and it could be hard to keep track of where opponents are or where they potentially could be, especially if your team currently is at a disadvantage in turf control and positioning. With the information gained by using point sensors though, this uncertainty can be turned into clarity that can make your matches much easier to follow and save you from getting surprised or sneaked up on by your opponents. All this talk is getting pretty theoretical, so let's break it down into more practical examples to show what I'm talking about. As previously mentioned, Splatoon can often present you with situations where you aren't exactly sure where to anticipate an opponent to be positioned that may be a threat to you if you try to advance forward. The more map control the opponent has, and the more positions that they have shown presence in previously, the worse of a problem this becomes. In these situations, throwing a point sensor at positions that you're worried about is a quick and easy way to scout out these positions and figure out if an opponent is there waiting for you or not. Since sensors are so ink efficient and can travel far, you can use them fairly frequently without putting yourself at much risk. If your sensor tags any enemies, you receive immediate confirmation that your concern was justified. You can now focus your attention and resources such as specials into dealing with those enemies that you've now located. Alternatively, if you censor a position and it does not tag anybody, then that in itself is still valuable information. Knowing there is not an enemy there, you can comfortably shift your focus to the next most relevant threat to you and not invest any additional time or resources that you otherwise would have needed into clearing that space normally. You can then repeat this cycle again and again for every position or approach option your opponent currently controls that catches your attention. Identify a potential threat, check it with a point sensor, and react as necessary to the information you get from that. In this way, sensors turn many situations that may feel like a gamble or a coin flip between multiple potential threatening positions into manageable, isolated pieces that can be picked apart one at a time. All the while, due to sensors' cheap cost and ease of use, this process can be done efficiently and reliably without slowing you down as the user. The quick and guided decision making that comes from scouting positions with point sensors is helpful in preparing yourself for engagements, but the value of tracking the opponent's location certainly does not stop there. Information is also useful in the process of taking and finishing fights. It may seem obvious, but it really is a lot easier to know where to aim as you engage on a fight with an enemy when your target is literally highlighted for you. Oftentimes, fights in Splatoon will also have some visual clutter involved that may normally make it a bit difficult to keep your aim tracked on your opponent, like if they enter squid form or start swimming around a lot, if there are explosions and other large and bright visual effects going on around you. Having your opponent marked nullifies these concerns though, as you'll still maintain a clear visual on them no matter what clutter may temporarily come up between you and them. And if your opponent doesn't want to fight you and tries to escape, then that'll be a pretty tough task for them, as no amount of walls that they may try to retreat behind will obscure them from your view. You'll be free to chase them down all that you like, so long as they're still marked. This point transitions nicely into our next idea, which is point sensor's synergy with certain weapons. Many of the weapons that come with point sensor are AOE, or area of effect weapons, such as custom explosher, custom blaster, sloshing machine neo, and the new custom wellstring. These weapons naturally play around their large hitboxes that allow them to hit opponents behind cover that would otherwise be safe against other weapons. This identity combos beautifully with point sensors, as having their opponents marked gives these weapons direction on exactly where to send their shots, and it that no amount of cover is enough to hide behind. AoE weapons tend to be slow firing and high on ink consumption, so having a sub weapon that helps them make the most of every shot and that isn't too taxing on their ink tank really goes a long way. Point sensors don't only synergize with main weapons, but can also work around their users' specials. The most direct case of this is Tri Zuka on both the Sloshing Machine Neo and Gluga Dooley's Deco. Zuka is already a nightmare to survive against as it is, but if that Zuka user can see your exact location thanks to a point sensor beforehand, then it's already over for you. In general though, any special appreciates the extra direction and where to aim or move to to find its targets most efficiently, such as chasing down someone in a Kraken from Heavy Splatling Deco, or helping killer whales from Spider-Shot Nova find their targets with ease. Developing this idea further, remember once again that it's not only you who gets to see opponents that you've tagged with a sensor, but everyone on your team as well. When using sensors, your whole team benefits from the extra direction and quicker decision making that the information from point sensors provides. Any AoE weapon on your team will have an easier time clearing enemies out from behind cover. Every bomb thrown and special activated by your teammates can be timed and aimed with greater confidence, knowing with certainty that there's an enemy in the path of it. To me, this is where point sensors truly shine, especially in a game that doesn't have voice 
chat built into regular matches, having a tool that ensures all of your teammates can be aware of where the opponents are is certainly appreciated. Even without direct communication, diligent point sensor use can go a long way in both enabling your teammates in general and also keeping them aware. With that said, point sensors don't have to be all about support. We've already discussed how information from sensors can help you choose the right fights to take and keep an advantage within them, but there's also a way to directly benefit from helping your teammates. Whenever a teammate gets a splat on an opponent tagged by your point sensor, you'll be rewarded with an assist. And you see, there's a gear ability in this game that absolutely loves it when you get assists, that being Opening Gambit. For those who don't know, Opening Gambit grants its user with 3 main gear slots, or 30 ability points each, of run speed, swim speed, resistance, and intensify action. That is a lot of mobility perks. So when this ability is active, you are incredibly fast, a lot like having Tacticooler active. The catch for this ability though is that it normally only gives you these buffs for the first 30 seconds of a match, hence the name, after which the effects are gone for good. That is, at least, unless you get a kill or assist during that opening 30 seconds. For every kill or assist card that you get while Gambit is still active, its remaining duration will increase by a whopping 15 seconds. I'm sure by now a lot of you can see where I'm going with this. Thanks to point sensors being so cheap and quick to use, and also their potential to rack up large amounts of assists, weapons with point sensor are some of the most reliable in the game at maintaining their opening gambit for a long time, sometimes even keeping it active for the entire match. If you've seen players running around with opening gambit on the Splattershot Nova for example, this idea is exactly why. If your teammates get to benefit from having every opponent marked for easier splats, and you get to benefit from having insane mobility perks consistently, then everyone is winning. If this idea sounds like something you want to try, then and I also suggest having some sub power up equipped to get reach more opponents with your sensors and keep them tracked longer, making it easier to keep getting those assists that you need for Gambit to stay active. That's just about everything to know about point sensors. If there's one thing to truly take away from this, it's that when a weapon has point sensor, don't judge it purely by the sub weapon, as it's easy to convince yourself that sensors aren't a useful tool for a weapon if you compare sensors' lack of direct impact to the damage, pain output, and other traits of other sub weapons. Rather, consider how having access to direct information through sensors can influence and affect the way that you and your team can play the game. Point sensors aren't the only thing in the game capable of inflicting the marking effect onto opponents. Other subs like Ingleshoot and Ink Mine can too, as well as Wavebreaker. However, none of these match the efficiency and uptime that sensors have in doing so. There's nothing conditional about how or when sensors can tag opponents, so persistent sensor use can make additional information feel like a passive ability with how often and reliably opponents get marked. That unique influence on a match is something no other subweapon provides in the same way. The video is done now, but as always, I want to give a bit of an update to those who care about it, so check it it's been a little while since the last installment of this series. This is normally the part where I say I haven't uploaded in a while because I've been so busy with college and life and other things, to an extent that's certainly true, but I've also been taking a bit of a break for another reason. In the intro to all my videos, I call myself a high-level competitive player, and overall that is true. A lot of y'all even know about my previous team, Terry Limeade, that I competed with for nearly two years, that disbanded about six months ago now. Essentially, after that team disbanded, I realized that I've really been selling myself short and how much I could really be doing to improve as a player and try to reach the goals I individually have in terms of performance and competitive play. I'd really even started investing a lot of my energy into content, into coaching and other things, and I didn't even realize how much I was actually sapping into my time or energy or motivation to just improving myself as well as a player. So over these last few months, I've really been focusing a lot on my own play, trying to study up, practice a whole lot, get better mechanically, get better about the game, understanding the theory, playing things that are a bit more optimal overall, just doing all sorts of like, stuff I can to move myself from being just a good player to truly getting back on track to trying to be one of the best. This is largely just a personal goal, but does also come back around to content and coaching. As I like to focus on a lot of educational stuff, the better of a player that I become, the better knowledge and experience I can actually share with the rest of y'all and the things that I make. Essentially, while I'll be going back to devoting a lot of my energy on this game and free time for it as well into improving myself as a player, it does also mean that when I do coaching and when I do make videos like this, I should hopefully be sharing some better information with all of y'all as well and making a higher quality product. That all being said, I have just started my summer break and I have a few months free before I have to go back to more classes at college in the fall, so I will have a lot more time and energy to put into videos and I promise it will not be another five month wait until the next one. I really enjoyed this utility series and really want to wrap it up. We have two more subs to hit and I really want to get that done by the end of the summer if possible, if not, hopefully not too long after. In addition to that, I also have several ideas for other nerdy videos I really want to make that I'm really looking forward to. So you should hopefully have at least a few more nice projects done within the next few months here. 
year. Also, since I have mentioned coaching, it's also worth saying that in the past, I have promoted a lot of my coaching services on Medify in my description and shutting that out in the videos. But due to recent changes on that platform, I'm not really working there anymore. I am still providing coaching just to some close friends who I've worked with a few times in the past and that's really comfortable with. But long term, I will be looking for an alternate place to provide coaching or some other system to do it. And once that does happen, I'll definitely be sharing that here in the description or something like that. So those of you who do hear about it through my videos can still find a way to get that service. Anyway, with all that said, it is really nice to be back to this and I really hope you all enjoyed the video. As always, thank you all for watching and have a good one.